Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Energy News Beat Podcast. My name's Stu Turley, President and CEO of the Sandstone Group. We have an absolute, a mitigated, wild ride going on in the United States right now. Not only do we have misinformation, but we have the desire to have total disinformation out there. Not only is it affecting your pocketbooks, it's got inflation going on. And I happen to have a wonderful guest today. I have David L. Savage. He's an author, he's an energy expert, and we are here to have a wonderful discussion around the misinformation out there. Welcome, David. Well, thank you very much for having me on, Stuart. I'm looking forward to our conversation. I'll tell you what, besides just being a good looking man, I love your hairline, David. I'll tell you what, you and I got the same barber. Yes, yes. You know, it works. Uh, low maintenance. Hey, uh, what what is your podcast? Because there's what's worse than having a bunch of women go to the bathroom at the movie theater is two podcast hosts talking to each other. <laughs> I'm not sure which is worse, but what's the name of your podcast? My podcast is called Wrestling with the Inner Man. And the tagline is because the first fight we face each and every day is the fight between our selfish, sinful nature, which I think everyone is 100% familiar with. Right. And then at least for those of us who are Christian, our Holy Spirit inspired divine nature. And so you got kind of the angel on this shoulder, the devil on this shoulder, and you're like, how am I going to respond? You know, So uh, it's unlimited content. And it's just whether people will be transparent enough to come on and talk about it. And so like, and my most recent one is on... Uh, Greed's destruction of college football. So people, can uh, you know, I think that that is a great point because I am disappointed that uh, OU has has left the uh, the Big Twelve and is going to the SEC, and that just really breaks my heart. But then again, we at least OSU won the last you know yeah. match. But let's get to energy here for just a brief moment. When we we talk about the grid and we talk about the grid is really it doesn't care about anything. It's got physics and fiscal responsibility. And if you don't have that in balance, you're going to have high cost of energy and you're going to have blackouts. There's a bunch of stuff going on out there, David, that's just nuts with the energy pro policies in the country. Well, we have this horrible thing that is so inappropriately named, you know, called the, uh, well, it's really the Green New Deal, but it's called the Inflation Reduction Act. And basically it has so subsidized green energy to distort markets so that mm -hmm. the real reliable energy, which would be natural gas generation makes the most sense for electricity production or nuclear even, you know, but that's harder to build out fast. Right. The capital is not even available because if you go to the bank and you're Duke Energy or somebody who wants to build a natural gas power generation plant said, hey, you know, we had a bad experience during URI. We got 1,300 right. people a day moving to Texas and no one's bringing any electricity with them. Oh, yeah. So how do we meet this demand? And it's not always windy and it's not always sunny. So to have everybody... 100% of all people, regardless of their political brand, wants the light to come on when they flip the switch all the time. And, and, and they just expect it. They think that it's magic and it's because the building is there that the electricity happens. You've got a lot of things going on behind the, 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 the grid. In fact, the balancing authorities, David, those poor guys are worse than air traffic controllers as far as the stress goes on balancing a grid. You know, whether you have wind or solar, you have to do that. I wouldn't want that job. That would be a horrible job. Well, it's very difficult because, you know, the variability. We, we didn't used to have that variability. You ran your coal or you ran your nuclear or you ran your natural gas and it just ran and was pretty much steady state, you know, and but when you start adding this intermittent surges of electricity that are coming into the grid from wind when it's super windy or when it's really sunny, people don't understand, you know, we as engineers do, you know, but right. we have a responsibility to educate the public. It's like, look, this stuff, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of a good metaphor illustration, you know, of something else that you might need that needs to be steady but you know just breathing you know it's like oh, what if you just yeah. had a rush of air come in <laughs> it's like you you need it to be steady and that's what makes it reliable and then managing you know the, uh, the influx and, and then the the shortage right and the grid makes it much more vulnerable to disruption and and outages 
Well, you know, the the funny thing is in, in Texas, I read an article yesterday and they said that Texas needs to double the ability and capacity of their grid in the next five years because demand is doubling in Texas in the next five years. It took 100 years to build the grid. We're going to double it in five? Well, that's because you have things like this gigantic Samsung chip manufacturing plant and these data centers that are such energy hogs, which people don't realize, you know, this is the new like AI and everything. Well, it takes a lot of computing power to uh, to run that. And, and then, of course, we have, you know, the, the jobs uh, picture with the state of Texas and all the people that are coming here. So, yeah, the demand is unbelievable. And, you know, Texas is already well in, you know, we went way in on wind and solar, but it's just not going to meet the demand and hydroelectric. If, if you look at the pie chart, right. renewables has barely moved the needle, you know, from the hydroelectric dams that have been around for a hundred years right. to, uh, you know, with the wind and solar, it's still, you know, 70%, 80% is. I was reading those numbers and, it, and it's terrible. We spent three or four trillion dollars what's a few trillion dollars between friends and we've only gotten 15 percent of the electrical grid is covered by renewable energy and that renewable is that marketing term i i think it's funny well the problem also is the cost of the transmission see because when you build all these solar panels <laughs> out in west texas they got to get it to a station and then was they're not really they're not so environmentally conscious about what is you know if we try to build a pipeline to connect to connect Canadian oil, you know, at Keystone, you know, pipeline right. because it crosses the international border. But if you want to build a transmission line and you want to tear through, you know, some kind of right. you know, coyote habitat or whatever, so, you know, you can just do it at will because it's it's for the green policy. But you know, the, the green policies like the Wall Street, the Wall Street Journal, let me read this title to you. The New York Times, excuse me, the New York Times, Harris's new strategy equate fighting climate change with freedom, framing it as patriotism, a novel way of framing climate change. In my opinion, climate is changing naturally. And then we have geoengineering going on. And geoengineering should be banned, in my opinion, uh, you know, chemtrails. I thought everybody was sitting there going along going, oh, chemtrails are not real. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. just said yesterday he wants to ban chemtrails. How, if, if we're going to have geoengineering and we're going to have climate change, oh, let's let nature take its course on some of these things. Well, I think, you know, as a Christian, I think you have to... God created the universe. And <laughs> I don't think man has the slightest idea to accurately model a planetary weather, you know, like global climate, anything. We can't get the weather forecast right, you know, 50% of the time right here on the Gulf Coast. And yet, you know, we believe that we have that kind of understanding. So, and if you look at ice ages and the recession of ice ages and things that have been happening with solar cycles, you know, the sun has like an 11 year solar cycle. And that's why like we've had an extremely wet year this year right. in Houston. You know, we've had our wettest year on record, like over 50 inches of rain already this year. So right. we don't understand it. And there, there's just an agenda. This is a this is a Trojan horse, man. They're trotting out some idea that they think because they they want to claim a higher moral authority. Like, look, Stuart, you know, you're a climate denier and I'm trying to save the planet. You know, look what a do-gooder I am. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And take my tax money to do it. I, I love Dan Bongino is absolutely a hoot. And he calls the Inflation Reduction Act the porculus bill. And I, I think that that is actually hilarious when you think about the porculus bill that I believe Kamala Harris was the deciding vote on that. Well, she was the deciding vote on many things in the Senate, and they were all straight party votes, by the way. And I hope American public remembers that as we experience this pain that we are already well down the road on. You know, we were kind of alluding to about Zuckerberg and honesty. One of the things that I had have done is I banned my company from advertising on Meta products. We have done great advertising campaigns for our clients before on Meta, on Facebook. It is a great platform if you're wanting to advertise on it. But because of Zuckerberg's inability to keep child trafficking off of his platform, I, I have want absolutely nothing to do with him. 
And then with him coming out and apologizing and saying, wait a minute, ethics matter. It's very much like the grid. Grid relies on fiscal responsibility and physics. Ethics matter. And I, I personally would like to see him go to jail. But speaking of ethics, I had a club in the back of my head years ago. I had a, a social problem that really had a very good eye opening on this thing called a walk to Emmaus. And you and I were kind of laughing about a walk to Emmaus on that. And you've had a few experiences on that. Ethics matter. I think I would love to sponsor Zuckerberg on a walk to Emmaus. I think it'd be great for anybody to go on it. It's it is transformational to experience, you know, agape love. The best mankind can reproduce it for a seventy-two hour period, and I couldn't recommend it more highly to anybody. And it was just a real spiritual mountaintop in my life that was very formative as a new father back in nineteen ninety four when my kids were like two and one years old. Oh, that, that is really cool. Where, where did you go through your, your walk to Emmaus? Uh, in Corpus Christi, Texas. Corpus Christi. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you what, I got stapled to the back of the head and I, I just really appreciate Mark McAdow was my pastor and he showed up with handcuffs. Cause I was like, nah, I don't need to go. Yeah. I was <laughs> reluctant to. And, and it was one of the best single th- events in my life. And I am very grateful to him for that. And so, and, and having these kind of conversations, David, is a kind of like the, the talking point of your podcast is, you know, you got to stay on track. It's yes. one thing just to, to, to go on an event, have a great event, but then go back to your old habits is absolutely not good for anybody. No, I had a, I had a terrific Emmaus reunion group, you know, and we met each week and I still have, nice. I have, a, I have a team. anyway, my, my card on how you go through the reunion, you know, it's just, it's oh, like when yes. you have an opportunity where, you know, discipleship was denied, you had a, you had a chance to actually help somebody and then you didn't actually do it. Or when you did, and I, I went to that every week with a group of men for probably three years and that accountability and sharing and that common yes. desire to humble yourself, you know, before God and, and to confess, you know, really confession is so important because pride and ego and narcissism is just rampant these days. And oh, you know, we yeah. have to realize we're flawed, we're broken people, and we need a savior. Everybody needs a savior. And so that's that's how I feel about it. It informs, you know, everything that I do or talk hey, about. I guarantee I would not be here if it was not for that weekend. So yeah, it, it was special. But I'll tell you what, if more men, and this brings up a bigger bigger issue that we have got as a country to solve problems, not only our energy problems, but as men, we have to stand up and protect our neighbors and we have to protect our families and we cannot allow our children to be handled the way that we have what 300,000 missing children in our border this is unbelievable we as men in our households need to stand up and protect our families and our neighbors well i certainly agree with that that's really what my whole post retirement life is all about you know my message is to try to help the you know my podcast the book i wrote everything is aimed at an 18 to 30 year old young male who may have grown up without a father due to divorce or right. household or an absent father who may have been an alcoholic or a workaholic or you know all the other holics of it people can fall prey to and you know they they basically are incomplete they don't have the ballast in their boat so when they go out to sea, a little wave tips them over and they can't overcome that adversity because they don't have that gravitas, you know, of someone saying, look, I believe in you, man, you have what it takes. You can make it. You can you can suffer a setback. And, you know, you have this whole generation that's just grown up with these participation trophies. And it's like, guess what? When you get out of the real world, someone kicks you in the teeth and you really lose. And and some we haven't prepared them for it. And so when they experience it, they have no way to, to recover. And so as men, you know, what we need to do is have an intergenerational connection to these younger men and try to fill that right. gap, you know, however we can through, you know, one-on-one discipleship efforts, men's ministries, however, to help these young men who who didn't get what they, they should have gotten, you know, and they deserve to have. And that's 
you know, the love of an older man pouring, you know, his wisdom into them. In your book, The the Savage Path, is pretty pretty cool. I have not read it yet, but I am going to. And you had a foreword on it by Ed, Dr. Ed Young. Yes, I did, which was kind of a coup, really, because he doesn't do that. Obviously, he gets requests for that kind of stuff all the time. Right. And, you know, I was a deacon at Second Baptist Church here in Houston for, you know, 16 years. And, you know, I traveled to Israel with Dr. Young. You know, I went to China. We hosted Chinese students. I went to China with Second Baptist Church. I went to Normandy wow. with Second Baptist Church. And so I, I got to know him pretty well. And he preached a strong message of what basically I just was talking about. And I said, look, this is what I hear in the pulpit. And there's all this push, you know, against anything that is healthy Christian masculinity. And who's going to resist? You know, wow. everybody's just rolling over on it. And I said, I've written a book. I've, I've kind of taken the courageous step. And this is what you preach from the pulpit. Please, would you write my foreword? And he said, you know what? I, I normally don't do those, but I will do it for you, David. And so I'm extremely proud of the fact that he wrote that forward for me. That is really cool. Now, going through your book process, I'm just now getting my book in order. And it's about the puzzle pieces of energy. I mean, it, it, it is a whole different animal. But what was your thought process behind your book? Well, the the kernel or, you know, or the seed of the idea was I was so angry about the, uh, the teardown of the Boy Scouts of America. So I am an Eagle Scout. I got all three palms. I was a Philmont Ranger and led people on backpacking trips. Wow. And I started my own high adventure post and, you know, just had this incredible scouting career. And now the word boy isn't even in the scouting program anymore. And I said, you yeah. know, that was the best youth organization in the country to train up young men to be physically strong, right. mentally awake and morally straight, which is what our country needs. And it was torn down and by evil. And so where's the response? And so I, I said, I have to do that. I have to write. A I'm going to write this book. And, and so cool was that? originally it was and I don't want to give too much about the book away. But so it's titled The Savage Path a memoir of modern masculinity. And the path is a, a metaphor on my life as a lifelong backpacker. So I backpacked everywhere. And then when you backpack, you make mistakes and then they're much more costly <laughs> when you don't have, you know, when you're right. in bad weather or hail or, you know, you, you, you run out of fuel and those things, you it remember matters. those lessons. <laughs> so what the, the, the title is, the savage path is that, you know, God has a plan for us and, and, Really, the theme of the book is all men need three things. You know, we need a work to do, a will to obey, and a woman to love. The three devils. And so that that path is the one that God has ordained for us. And we stick to the trail when you're hiking. Man, it usually goes pretty good. But when you get off the trail, you're bushwhacking. Absolutely. It doesn't go so well. And it's the same in life. When you get out from under, you know, God's protection and his plan for your life, he'll let you experience those consequences. And you can get lost. And you can get cold. And you can get hungry. And then finally, you kind of go, what am I thinking? I'm, I'm the prodigal. I'm, I'm going to go back to my father yep. and get on the trail again. I'll tell you, I, the fact that my son got his Eagle Scout, I only made it to life. But I was a very involved dad, and I got NRA certified for black powder pistol, rifle, shotgun, got it all. And I had all the, the things. I taught the kids how to do axe throwing, knife throwing, archery. I was the guy. That's what young men need. It's a little bit, they, extra, a little bit of excitement. You know? we, were, we were out there all the time. In fact, I remember one scout camp. They were sitting there, and I'm, I'm going, and this is the dumbest thing I've seen young men do. And they were flamethrowing with aerosol and flame, you know, having a flamethrower fight. And the scoutmaster, I was the assistant scoutmaster and the scoutmaster, I'm not like Waltz. I'll say that I was the assistant scoutmaster, not <laughs> the coach. And the scoutmaster comes up and I'm the assistant. He goes, they need to stop that. And I go, I'm going to let them burn themselves first. You know, and, and so he, he goes, you got it. And he walks off and I let them burn themselves and they got their eyebrows burning. They never did it again. And you have to let stupid boys grow up in a right way. I mean, and that's a great place to do it. Natural consequences is what I call it. You know, they're, they're pretty, of course, nowadays you get sued, you know, for something like that, but it, it's a very valuable teacher. Yeah. But you know, when I was, we had big jamborees and we're 
and I have 500 kids roll through my, my line and seeing underprivileged kids being able to do black powder and I've got my raccoon hat on and I'm teaching them how Daniel Boone used to do this and everything else and hit, letting them hit those metal clang targets and that feeling of really understanding a black powder gun or a BB gun or a arrow or those things, that self-confidence Yes. And get them to the next life lesson. For sure. I got a funny story. I don't know if this is well. So when I was working at Philmont, you know, you get good at all that. And so, we oh, had, yeah, you know, Black Mountain was where they had the black powder gun. And I had a crew from Kalamazoo, Michigan. And these kids, man, they're like kind of in awe of the Ranger because they're like, you're so good at everything. And I said, you know what? I'm a crack shot. Of course, we're all braggarts because we're from Texas, too. You know, <laughs> I said, all 13 of you, I, I could shoot a hole through your hats with one bullet throw all your hats up in the air and I'll shoot a hole through all of 13 of them with one bullet. And they were like, no way. And so, you know, we did the whole shooting thing. And then they were said, all right, you know, Ranger Savage, we want to see you do it. And so I, I collected all of their hats and I just stacked them all right on top of one another and just barely threw it up in the air over the barrel and then blew a hole in it. And there was a hat shower, you know, of bullet holes. And it was their favorite souvenir. Oh, sure. Now that's funny. I, 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 that I did not see coming. I was. I got a lot of stories like that from, from my scouting days and experiences. We have a few of those too, like putting a chicken underneath a scout's tent. So the raccoons will go in and you can't buy this kind of entertainment. You know, that's right. There's a lot of fun things out there. So, well, people, how do people find their, your book? It would be on Amazon. Yeah, it is. It's on Amazon. It's, I have a website that's www.thesavagepath.com. And in fact, I just created my new 501c3 nonprofit that I've told you I was doing. I just got it today. Yeah. It came and here it is. Congratulations. The Savage Path Ministries. There it is. And so. I like web- it. Zoom. Legal Zoom. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm all set with that and I'm deeply committed to the book and the podcast. So the website's the savage path.com and fantastic. You can I know find out about the book or, or the, the podcast wrestling with the inner man at that website. I'll tell you what, this is going to be absolutely phenomenal because I know that I'm feeling hopeful that there is a awakening going on in the United States. And I think that as men and I, I used to consider myself a Republican. I have stepped away from the Republican Party, and I'm now an American. I am tired of Democrats and Republicans. Amen. I am an American, and y'all need to start listening to us. You work for us. And this is now getting where we as men are now needing to take care of our neighbors in our household, because there is an emergency coming like you would not believe, and it's coming around the corner very quickly. Well, that's exactly right. And Stuart, I think I told you I was a delegate at the National Republican Convention, you know, in Milwaukee, and I've, I've got the same problem. It's a bad brand. And and so, yep. is, so is the Democrat. The D and the R are bad brands. And, yep. you know, we were trying to just get more people... To, Let's quit focusing on identity politics. We don't need to, you know, I got interviewed by uh, several TV stations when I was up there and they asked me, you know, how I felt about, you know, Biden and whether he was going to resign, all that at the time hadn't happened yet. And I just said, look, you know, we don't need identity politics. We don't need to elect Kamala Harris just because she's a woman of color and that's the only right. basis for a vote. We need to elect the smartest, most competent people and those people right. running our government and not be doing it around identity politics. And what, what that means to me is, you know, we go back to being the melting pot America where we're all just Americans. Like you just exactly. said, we don't have African-American, Asian-Americans, LGBTQ, however many letters yeah. Americans. You know, we're all Americans and we need to work together and focus on what we have as a common interest because the world is watching. And you know what? There's a lot of adventurism going on right now that we're all pretty nervous about in the Middle East, in Ukraine, in Taiwan, because they see us divided. As weak. They see us as weak and we need to stand up as men united and and take charge amen Uh, and so well thank you so much david for stopping by the podcast today i just really appreciate you and i'd like to have this as a regular series in talking about things because i feel that having energy discussions 
is the basis for our finances around the entire country because energy affects everything. And when President Trump was saying, I am going to drill baby drill and lower energy prices, that was his first step to get rid of inflation. Oh, look at yep. that, Harold Hamm. Yep. Yeah, I mean, this is a great book. It was given to everybody who was a delegate at the convention. And yeah, neat. it really helps people understand how energy is just crucial, to, especially energy independence. And then to our allies, you know, if, if we're asking Germany to unhinge themselves from Russia and dependence on natural gas, then we're going to need to provide the LNG to export it. And then we have this Biden administration that's just ruining all of this. I mean, the steps, anyway, you and I, because we're informed about what's happening in energy, we also know all of the extraordinary measures they've taken to uh, undo what was American that was energy independent under the Trump years. You know, and, and it's one of the things about trust that we were talking about, and that is the mainstream media. Nobody trusts the mainstream media. I think that's one of the reasons that our podcast is doing so well. We get an average of 50,000 people a day to our news site. And then we have this year about 181 point. 8 million downloads or something like that. Unbelievable, nice traction, life's good as far as that. And I, I think it's because people are starving for the, the truth. We've had about right. 8 million transcript reads. I mean, this is just unbelievable to me. And thank you to the mainstream media. I'd like to thank you all for being a bunch of lying nutheads. Yeah, uh, it's, it's so, I don't know, inexplicable. It used to be that, you know, if there was a scandal in either party, there's news. It, it seems like they've just forgotten that there's at least half of America that's a market, you know, for that news, that, that news product. And I don't know how it got so monopolized monopolized and so biased and just well it's it, scary I, it, it, it really is scary because there are people pushing like this whole climate agenda which is right. the, the biggest red herring ever you know and look no one cares more about the environment than me as an eagle scout as an outdoors person who still backpacks every year i just bought an airstream trailer i visit all the national parks and that's what harold ham talks about is how successful we've been with natural Gas is a clean energy uh, and nuclear. I was a nuclear engineering major when I started at AM, and m and then unfortunately Three Mile Island happened and I decided I better get a different uh, major. <laughs> but, you know, we, we need nuclear in the you know, we, we need can, nuclear bad. Be nuclear for the electricity generation. And you're starting to see actually these small scale nuclear facilities at like Dow in Freeport, you know, to run their plant right. and, and because they need that reliability. And so, you know, we need liquid hydrocarbon transportation fuels because that infrastructure already exists and people have no idea about the pipelines and everything that move, you know, liquid hydrocarbons around this country so we can all drive an internal combustion engine car. And this push for EV vehicles and, you know, Ford discontinued, you know, their production line. It just, it, it doesn't work. It's not, people don't want it. It's not it, ready yet. It cost them $1.9 billion. Unbelievable. Well, these poor people that are buying the EVs and then in a couple of years and they realize how much it costs to replace the battery and their car has no resale value, they're going to be mad. But they've already been hoodwinked. You know, they've already cast their vote in these elections and things. And yep. it's 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 evil is what it is. That's all I can say. I do want a cyber truck. I, I'm going to go on record and say <laughs> that I do want an electric, I want, but I can't have it as my primary car just because of range thing. But it's the cyber truck is is besides having a slopey roof, and the Secret Service would not be, they're afraid of it. You know, the Secret Service is really afraid of that slopey roof. Oh, Stuart, but, those things are hideous. Those are the ugliest things I've ever seen. But they're bulletproof. <laughs> Have you seen the Chicago model? I mean, it's got uh, No, I, I, I mean, parked by one at Lowe's yesterday, but it was just, I don't know. They're bulletproof. You can shoot them with a 45 <laughs> semi-auto. They're, they're fine. I want one. I want bulletproof car. <laughs> Better yet, I think I'll just go get a Ford 250 and bulletproof it and, and put a uh, armor on it. All right. And you can put all your doom prepping dehydrated foods in there and you'll be the, the mad mad survivor. All right. So with that, thank you all very much. Subscribe, like, share, read this to your pets, and more importantly, reach out to someone and really try to help them out. Thank all right. you all. God very bless much. you, Stuart. Thanks for having me on.